Well, this morning, we're going to be opening up a new message series called The Grace Awakening. And this morning, I want to talk to you about uh, the free gift. Now, I like free gifts. Yeah, I know you do too, right? We all love free gifts. In fact, I may not like the gift, but as long as it's free, I receive it. I know it's the same with you folks too. Amen? Yeah. Now, we're going to adjust the halo a little bit because um, I'm going to share with you something that I've observed and uh, maybe you can relate and and don't be afraid to adjust your halos, okay? Uh, Because, you know, I've noticed that when people uh, go to Costco, sometimes they don't go to Costco to buy food. They go there because they want to get the free gift of those free little lunches things they're going on, they're, they're giving out, right? Yeah, yeah, you, that's, that's you guys, right? Adjust your halos, right? Yeah, you guys don't go there to purchase anything. You're just hungry and you say, ooh, free food. So you go and you push around the wagon like you're going shopping, right? And I know some of you folks, you, you, sometimes you like that. Uh, that little hors d'oeuvre looking thing, right, they give you, and you go back again for seconds, and you tell the person, oh, this is for my spouse. But you never come with anybody. No lie. Because I know some people, they go back all the, you know, they go back, they come around, they get a different wagon, right? And they say, oh, this is for my children. And you don't even have children with you, right? Why? Because every one of us, we love free gifts. We just love it. In fact, some of you this morning, you are here because you saw the title, Free Gift, and you never care who was speaking. You never care if Pastor Ken, oh, oh, Pastor Ken's speaking, I'm going to go. No, you saw Free Gift, oh, we got to go, right? But we all love free gifts, and the good news is that God gives us a free gift. Yeah, and that free gift is called grace. Grace, yeah, grace, no joke. So when God gives us grace, There is no hidden agenda. There is no small print. There is nothing. No, God says, I am going to give you my grace. And that's the topic of today's message is his grace. And as freely as God gives it, here it is. We need to receive it. So in your bullet point, would you write freely receive it? We got to freely receive it. We need need to accept God's grace in our homes. We need, to give, we need to accept God's grace in relationships, in our jobs, in our churches, in wherever we are at. We need God's grace in our workplace. How many of you would agree with that? Right? We need God's grace. But here's the thing. It is, God's grace is free. It would, it would be kind of crazy if you went to Costco and, you, and, you, and, you, and the lady gave you a sample of food and said, this is free. And then you took out your wallet and tried to pay for it. She would say, no, this, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. Costco paid for it. And so you just freely receive it. That's what grace is. God is saying, I'm freely giving it to you. Now all you need to do is freely just receive it. Just receive it. It's free. You know, the thing about it is we try to, it it seems so crazy that, that something so huge is free. And so we always think that there's a catch. But with God's grace, it is free. Amen. Let's read in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is what? The gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Circle gift of God. Yeah. It is a free gift of God. Let me give you an example. You know, when you go and get you, and Costco gives you that free, uh, you know, free snack or whatever, you take it, you receive it, and you say, oh, it's free. But watch this, Costco paid for it. So the grace that you receive for free is actually paid by Jesus on the cross. That's the reason why it's free to you. Because Jesus paid a hefty price on the cross for this thing called grace. We are saved by grace, not of works. In other words, there is not enough good works you can do to earn your salvation. You cannot earn your way into heaven. It is given to you by God's grace. Only by God's grace are you saved. It's it's not about how many doors you knock on, how many miles you travel on your bicycle, how many books of the Bible you read, memorized, how many times you came to church. There is not enough. You cannot afford to purchase your salvation or grace. Amen? Not as 
not as a result of works. Lisa and I, we went to Washington, and there we went to this place called the Smithsonian Museum of Natural, uh, uh, Natural History. And in, in that museum, there was um, uh, one place where it was kind of ele- really elegant and, and uh, really nice. And so we walked in, in there, and there they, they had the Hope Diamond. Ooh, and the hope that was inside this glass case, and it was just being, um, you know, you could see the sparkle, and it was so elegant and so beautiful, flawless. It was clear, the cut, the clarity, the color was impeccable, and it was like, everybody was like, ooh, wow, ooh, taking pictures with it. And so as I looked at it, I was like, wow, this is amazing, the hope diamond. And so I turned to one of the employees that was working there, and I was just curious. I said, hey, by the way, how much is that Hope Diamond? And the worker looked at me and he said, nothing. I thought, oh, what kind of cocky guy is this guy? <laughs> uh, nothing. You know, so I, I said, there's no, no way. What do you mean nothing? It has to cost something. He looked at me and said, Nothing. Okay, what you mean, nothing? He said, it's priceless. No one can afford it. I said, ah. And you know what? When I thought about it, I said, you know what? That's just like grace. It's priceless. You can't afford it. You just need to receive it. Amen? That's what it is. See, Jesus paid the price for it. And we just need to receive it because it's so priceless. Isn't that so cool? I remember Lisa, uh, you know, before I got really saved. And um, so I met Lisa at work and she invited me to church. And in my mind, uh, church people or people that went to church, they were like holy people. You know, in my mind, I thought only priests and nuns go to church. (laughs) People that have no problems, goody two-shoes people, right? People that don't smoke, don't swear, no drink, no do nothing, right? These are the folks that go to church. And so she invited me to church. Now, my background is nightclubbing. I was into the nightclub scene. I used to street dance and, you know, I used to drink and, and smoke Benson Hedges Ultralight Menthol, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, okay, I'm going to be real, right? Because we're talking about grace, right? And so, uh, you know, I used to drink, uh, you know, beers and stuff, Budweiser, because you deserve what every individual regularly, right? That's what the Budweiser stand for. Um, so, and I still remember that, right? So I think, I thought, man, you invited me to church. I don't want to go to church. Oh, I, you know, me, I felt so unworthy. You know, I, I feel like I'm a church-going guy, man, you know? But here's the thing. I, I, wanted, I wanted to hook up with Lisa so bad, I said, okay, I'll go to church. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm being real, okay, I just a halo now, okay. So, um, so I, I go to church, right, and sure enough, I, in my perspective, everybody was uh, goody two-shoes. Like, you know, everybody n- n- didn't do what I was doing, and I felt so unworthy, and because and I knew that I wasn't uh, living, living like a church-going person, and, and here's the thing, in my eyes, I, I, I felt unworthy, I, and I know that so many people feel that way because they examine their lives and in comparison to somebody else, their perception is um, they are more holy than I am and so I feel unworthy to go to church and even when I'm in church, I still feel unworthy and because I still feel that way, I feel condemned. Even though nobody talks to you, you feel that way, <laughs> right? Right? And, and I know, I, and so what happened was with me, I felt so much pressure, right? I, in Hawaii, we say pressure, right? There was so much pressure, but no one was pressuring me. <laughs> I felt so much pressure to be a certain way, uh, to uh, not smoke, not drink, and not do any kind, be good, be goody two-shoes, that I started to get anxiety attacks. Yeah, I never got anxiety attacks going to the nightclubs. But only I come to church, I get anxiety attack. I don't know why. What happened? 
right? Because I was trying to become and be something that I was not at that time, right? And I know some of us are in that place where you're here at church, but you're still struggling with your belief. You're still struggling with your faith. I'm not as good as the other person. I'm still struggling in my mess. I'm not, I don't even know if I believe yet. And you're going through that and you feel uh, unworthy. This message is for you. Because I was like that. I was that person that was not yet changed, and I come to church, right? And I feel this pressure to be a certain way and all this kind of stuff, and, and I'm starting to get anxiety. And until I heard this message about grace, oh, man, that changed everything for me. Grace can change your life. When I started to learn about grace, I tell you, the chains and the bondages from my heart started to be released. I felt freedom. I felt liberty. That's what Jesus came to give us by His grace. Amen? Grace removes the burden, the pressure. Grace removes the stress of trying to be who you are not. Trying to uh, become somebody uh, that you think, you know, your perception about somebody uh, in, in, a, in a short amount of time. Listen, I know you love God. You want to be better. You want to grow. You want to know more about God. That's why you're here at church. But unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we come to church and, and we have all these expectations. And, and, and you know, and so I want to communicate grace to you. I want to talk to you about grace. And here's the thing. Many of us, because we know that we're not perfect, there's a sense of inadequacy. There's a sense of unworthiness and, and stress that comes along. But here's the bottom line is this. Number one, would you write in your notes? All need to receive God's grace. Every single one of us, me included. Why? Because the Bible says here, all have sinned. Would you circle all? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's very best in our thought life, in our mouth, in our action, in our attitude. Just because I don't smoke, drink, that does not mean that you are sinless. If you've just thought something negative, you've sinned. If you looked at the woman with lust, you sin. If you've cursed, you sin. You see that? Every one of us, right? So all need to receive God's grace. And what is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. It means that we are, we are undeserving, and yet God gives his favor to us. He gives it. It means in the old Hebrew term, the word grace means to actually to bend or to stoop. Yesterday, I was watching uh, the royal couple get married, Prince Harry and Meghan. And so I was watching that, and, and the, 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 these royal guys, right, they're, they're in London, and some of you may have watched the Travel Channel or anything. So grace is... Is, let me show you what grace is. is. I saw this guy, this royal guy, and he was walking. There's commoners right on the side and just reaching out and taking pictures. Well, one of the royalty, he stops and he bends down to, to touch a young uh, child. And, and he, it's almost as if it was, he was blessing that person. That is what grace is. Grace is when royalty bends and stoops. To bless. There's nothing that the commoner can do. There's nothing that the, the commoner is deserving of. It's just grace is in the heart of, the, of nobility. And he stops. And he bends and he stoops to get on the same level as the commoner. That is what grace is. The Bible scholar uh, Donald Barnhouse, he said this. Love that goes upward is worship. Love that goes outward is affection. Love that stoops is grace. I love that. Grace is demonstrated, or love is demonstrated by grace that stoops. 
He bends down. When Jesus was water baptized, the Bible says when Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, the heavens opened up, and God the Father declared from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What was that? Jesus did not even do anything. He didn't heal anybody. His ministry hasn't even started. But God stooped down from heaven and blessed and graced. That was a demonstration of grace given to Jesus. That was vertical grace from heaven down to earth. When Jesus bent down and he stooped to wash his disciples' feet, that was grace. That was horizontal grace. So in other words, the same grace that you receive is the same grace that you need to give. There is nothing that, that Peter or his disciples deserve. Now, Jesus is nobility. He is the prince. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And here you have nobility stooping down to wash somebody's dirty feet. That is grace. So grace is something that we need to receive, right? And we all need it, but it's also a, something that we also have to give. So number two, would you write, we need to practice extending grace to others. Practice extending grace to others because we need grace in our homes. We need grace given to our spouse, our children. We need to receive that grace. Why? Because we're not perfect, right? We need grace between employers and employees, grace in our schools, grace in our church, grace everywhere. We need, a, we need grace. But we need to practice extending grace to others. The Bible says in Psalms 130, verse 3, it says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who would stand? None of us would stand. If God took out his pen and pad and, said he, and he kept record of every mistake, Every swear word, every failure, every bad attitude, none of us would stand. But yet there are some folks, right, that take out their pen and pencil, and that's what they do. Oh, mistake. Oh, you smoke. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. oh, you swore. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, you're just too low. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, right? That's what they do. They keep record. Listen, folks, as a believer, right? As children of God, God does not keep record of our sins. You know, his eraser is bigger than the lead. And that's what we need to do is we cannot keep record of of our sins. Don't keep record of your own sins. You keep record of your own sins, you open the door to self-condemnation. Yeah, because you're keeping record. Oh, I'm not this way. I'm not good enough. I'm, I've done this. I did that. Oh, I said this. Oh, and you keep keeping record, right? No, no. God, God goes, yeah, I know you did that, but my eraser is bigger. Watch it. <laughs> you see, and that's how we need to treat ourselves because that's how God treats us. He gives grace. Now watch this. The scribes, there's a scene in the Bible where the scribes and Pharisees Right? They bring a woman caught in adultery. And they set the, this woman in the middle of the court with Jesus there. And everybody's watching. And, and this is, see, here's the thing. Anybody caught in adultery deserved death. In that time, they deserved stoning. Yeah. And what's funny is when I read the scripture, it said that, that this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Think of it. Caught in the very act. What are the chances of that happening? So one has to ask uh, scribes and Pharisees, what were you doing, peeping Tom? (laughs) How in the world did you catch a woman caught in the very act unless you were looking for it? And there are some folks that don't know grace They are like grace killers that purposely look for mistakes and failures in other people. It says almost that they feel like God has given them like to be a police of people's moral life. And they come around, they take out their spiritual pencil, they come to church and they go, oh, I'm going to write you a ticket. And they look 
for stuff, right? And so here the scribes, the scribbles, they're scribing. They're writing down, and they come. They bring this lady who is caught in adultery. She's on her hands and knees. And, and they know that by law, she needs to die. The law says that you are, she is deserving of stoning. But then they turn to Jesus, right? And they say, Jesus, what say you? Watch how Jesus responds in John chapter 8, verse 6. But Jesus stooped. Circle that. Jesus stooped. Jesus gave grace. Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Oh, but these religious folks, these Pharisees and scribes, they were relentless because they want to press the point. They want Jesus to recognize that this person is a sinner. So what are you going to do, Jesus? And they kept pressing him. And watch how Jesus responds. He says, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped. Oh, there's that word stoop. Grace, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And the woman where she was, in the center of the court. So every one of us, they're judging the woman, and they're ready to to execute and, and fulfill the law. So they're, everybody is holding this stone and they're ready to, to hear what Jesus is going to say. And Jesus, he stoops down and he writes on the ground and, and they look at Jesus uh, bending down and giving grace and he's writing something and some theologians said that Jesus was writing the sins of every single one of them. And so when they saw their own sins, they dropped the stone. Because, isn't it so true, sometimes it's easy to look at somebody else's sins except your own. It's easier to judge other people and point a finger and yet real, don't realize that you got three fingers pointing back at you. Isn't that right? And so when he said that, watch this, they all dropped their stone. Now here in your bullet point, would you write there? Steward other people's sins with grace. Steward other people's mistakes, their failures with grace. Steward other people's not living up to your standard by, with grace. Now watch this. Grace needs to awaken because watch. I love this scripture because it said that, that when Jesus said that they dropped their stones and it says, beginning with the older ones. I want you to underline the word beginning and circle the older ones. Because I notice that a lot of times that as believers, the longer we start, we come to church, the longer we start serving the Lord, the longer we become Christians, sometimes the, the eyes of grace in our hearts starts to shut. Instead of being more full of grace, we become graceless. Our tolerance level of, of baby Christians who, aren't, who don't have their act together, who are still struggling with things of the world, who are still entangled with, with things in their lives. Sometimes as, as, as older believers, our grace tolerance, our grace eyeballs start to shut and we become critical and judgmental. So that begs the question, are, are, are you more concerned about their performance or are you more concerned about the person? See, the scribes and Pharisees were more concerned about this woman's performance as opposed to the person themselves. And so we need to learn how to steward other people's sins with, with grace because there are a lot of grace killers out there. And that's why it says beginning with the older ones. It begins with us, the ones that are, are older in the Lord and more mature in the Lord. We should be filled with more grace than the younger ones. See, it, was, it began with the older ones. So as we get older, are you becoming more graceless or graceful? And yet the Bible, in different parts of the Bible, it says to excel in love. So we should be excelling in grace, excelling in mercy, excelling in these areas. Amen? Amen. Our patience should be excelling because, you know what, when, when we look at those that are struggling 
And the reason when I look at with people that maybe come to church and they smell like smoke, right? It reminds me of me. And when I came to church, I didn't know about this grace, but I would want somebody to give me some grace. As Jesus gave grace for all of us, I was looking for, can you give me, I didn't know it at that time, but can I get some grace? Can you care for me about my person rather than my performance? I'm not there yet. I'm working towards it. I want to, but give me some grace. Would someone care about me? I remember sometimes people, you know, I would, people would make comments to me, P PK, Pastor Ken, look, that person is living together, and look, there was sick, there's sick people here. It's sick. They're, that person is smoking, and I can smell the alcohol. It's sick people, you know, sick, sick, sick people. And, and then this thing started, you know, he, he kept telling me this, and people keep pointing this out, and, and pretty soon I came to church, and I'm like, sick people. It's not sick people people coming to new hope you know and then you go to i go to the gym and then this guy right comes and goes look at all these unfit people look at them, unfit unfit i'm thinking yeah unfit look at us yeah un un unfit people then god started to 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 remind me he said ken if you go to the hospital and people go look at all the sick people here <clears throat> right? You wouldn't go, that's right, there's so much sick people in a hospital, junk this hospital. That's the reason why the hospital is there. If you well, you're not supposed to be there. Isn't that right? That's the reason why people go to the gym, right? If you all buff, you're all healthy, you, you don't need that. You need the gym uh, because you're unfit. And the church is a hospital and a spiritual gym. Right? And that's why we need grace. Folks, that's why we need grace. We're a hospital. That, you know, go to the hospital, you're sick, and then the doctor goes, okay, stay sick like that. That's right. That's good. No, the purpose is to, to take the sick person to make them well, an unfit to make them healthy. We're not there to leave them the same. Grace does not leave you the same. See? No, grace is there so that you can change, but we have to extend that grace Right? Number three, would you write, extending grace doesn't mean approving sin. Amen. Extending grace doesn't mean approving sin. It doesn't mean that you're endorsing the sin. It doesn't mean that you're accepting sin. It doesn't mean that you're giving license to the person to continue in sin. It doesn't mean that they can continue in their wrong behavior, their attitude, their thought life, whatever. It, 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 extending grace doesn't mean that you're approving sin sometimes people who are religious will look at somebody extending grace to the woman committing adultery they're saying you're soft on sin you're endorsing their sin how come you're not stoning this person how come you're not killing this person but extending grace doesn't mean that i'm approving the sin the bible says in romans chapter 5 verse 20 but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And so when people say Las Vegas is sin city, praise the Lord. Because grace abounds even more over here. That word abound means to means excel or to be plentiful. So where sin abounds, grace is even more plentiful. Someone said, well, so you're endorsing the sin, to, you're endorsing the person to remain and keep doing their bad behavior or whatever. I'm going to let the Bible answer that question. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it says this. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Of course not. <laughs> Underline that. That's your answer. <laughs> of course not. Don't be stupid. <laughs> right? Some people say, oh, I receive grace, so that, that means that I can just remain. I can keep doing this. Of course not. That's not the purpose of grace. Grace is given. When, when the Bible says grace uh, uh, abounds, God knows that, that grace has to abound in order to bring the person to repentance. A person needs grace. You see, see, here's the thing. Grace is like a covering. I need that grace so that I can change. Okay? I cannot change without God's grace. 
But God's grace has to follow me. See, why? To repent, to change my behavior, but it takes time. That's why I need God's grace. Does it make sense? So Jesus himself is not endorsing sin. Watch this. So he says, Jesus straightened up and Jesus said to her, woman. I like that. <laughs> he gets to the point. He, he's all oh, man. He doesn't say, girl. <laughs> he says, woman. Yo. Right? Where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. You see that? So Jesus gave grace, but he also says, sin no more, repent. Grace leads a person to repentance. See, when a person says, I can continue in my behavior and not change, but you giving me grace because I got God's grace. No, what they're talking about is cheap grace. Yeah. Cheap grace, okay, watch this. Cheap grace justifies the sin and not the sinner. True grace justifies the sinner but not the sin. And what Jesus was teaching us was not cheap grace, but was true grace. Because grace, in this context, leads a person to repentance. In other words, I have to change my behavior, my thought. I got to get it, you know, I have to uh, uh, quit smoking. Whatever it is, folks, it leads us to repentance. Why? Because in Romans, it says this, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. Repentance is the end product. It is the result. The kindness leads a person. God's grace leads me to continue in sin? No. It leads me to repentance. It doesn't endorse the sin. No, rather, grace is so powerful that it leads a person to change from their sins. You see that? But we need that grace extended to one another. We need the true grace to awaken in our lives. We need it. Instead of holding the stones and getting ready and writing down everybody's sins, or you did this to me, you said this. And, you know, here's the thing. When I, uh, when I was struggling, right, as a, in my sins as a nightclubber, I just came to church. I went to church because I wanted Lisa. I admit it. I confess. Okay? But I felt so much pressure to change and become good and gooder and, you know, and, and so what I used to do was I would, I, I would go, well, I go in church. I don't smoke. I'm not going to I don't like smell like smoke because, you know, I don't like everybody judge me and, you know, and, and so I, I didn't. But, you know, after church, <laughs> give me that cigar. <laughs> Right? <laughs> because why? We're so concerned about changing somebody's performance while God is more concerned about changing people's hearts. And God says in the scripture, he says, I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the person's heart. So when we start becoming like Pharisees and scribes and we're grace killers and graceless and we start writing down people's faults and, ooh, they smell like smoke coming to church. What kind of person there is? Church. You smell like alcohol. Oh, church. Oh, you bad attitude. Church. <laughs> right? They should leave the church. Go someplace else. Like that. Right? We, so we tell people, come church. Come just as you are. And you smell, oh, leave the church. And it smells thick. Come church so we can judge you. Come church so we can beat you up. Come church so we can stone you. So when we are more concerned with people's behavior, they get so much pressure. They, they, start, they start changing because of behavior. Watch this. When, when we look at someone's behavior, right, and they change it because of external pressure, they might do fine. But release the pressure, phew, 
they go back the other way. Why? Because there's not a change of heart. See, when my heart was changed because of God's grace, I didn't want to do what I was doing. You see that? There, had to, there was no need of any pressure. That's what grace is. Grace allows a person to change by the Holy Spirit in God's time. And it changes not the, just the behavior. He changes our hearts. And that's what he wants. Amen to that. Amen. You guys receive that? Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you need grace? Praise the Lord. I need grace. The only reason why we're here is by God's grace. The only reason we survive is God's grace. We need God's unmerited favor in our lives. Amen. Would you bow your heads in with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your grace. Your grace is sufficient. And so, Lord, I pray for this church and our lives that we would overflow with this thing called grace. Father, thank you for bending for us. Thank you for stooping for us. And Father, we ask that right now you cultivate our hearts. Let this church be a place of grace. That when we invite people just as they are, we mean it. But Lord, we know that you love them so much that you're not going to leave them the same, but you're going to lead them to repentance. But Father, for us, we extend grace. Just as much as we receive grace from you, we extend it to others. Because, Lord, this day, I choose to lay down my stone, knowing that we have all sinned. We have all sinned. And you don't keep record of any of our sins. No, we are forgiven. And with that, we extend that same spirit to others. Because, Lord, that's why you came. You came to set us free. You came to give us liberty, Father God, and we thank you. We are so grateful for that. Father, bless each one here. In Jesus' name, amen.